Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your kindness to give us your word, uh, a clear guide for life. It, it is, of course, so much more than that in your word. We get to know you. But we do thank you that you have not left us derelict, adrift to circumstance, subject to our own feeble minds and ways of thinking, but you have given us direction. You have revealed your will. Uh, in, in great measure, you've revealed your will for the universe. You've revealed decrees. You've revealed to us your prescriptive will, what you desire for humanity to do. And you've given us uh, guidelines. You've given us parameters. You've given us specifics about your will for our own lives. And we thank you for all of this. We need you. And we ask that you'd help us, even liberate us from paralysis this morning as we think about how to know your will. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I've made some bad decisions in life. Like that time I decided it would be a good idea to throw a can of spray paint into an open fire. I was in junior high school in the West Valley, out on the edge of the desert. Our neighborhood was fairly new, so there were some wide open spaces still under construction. And my buddy and I, who shall remain nameless had taken up all the surveying stakes of the expansion of the neighborhood. I don't know what that cost the construction company and the surveying company. The police did make the trip to the front door. But we had taken all these survey sticks and we had played swords with them and we had built forts with them and eventually we bundled them up into a bonfire and, and set them alight. And what got my dad's attention was the loud explosion that sent metal shrapnel into the brick retaining wall and somehow missed me and my buddy. And we got a pretty good holler in that for that one. I've made other bad decisions. Uh, free climbing, way too high, way too exposed, unprotected, a couple of times, unwise. I don't know about you, if you think back to your life, you may think about decisions that you've made that were frankly, poor decisions. You might think back to other decisions that you made that were, who knows if they were good or bad decisions, but the outcomes were great or the outcomes were very poor. Sometimes we recognize our need for help in decision-making. And, and if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've probably often wondered, what is the will of God for my life in this decision? Which shirt should I wear today? Whom should I marry? What house should I buy? What job should I take? What college should I go to? And maybe you've scoured your Bible for the answers to such questions and left wondering, there, there must be another source to find out what God's will is for my life. I mean, how am I to make good decisions? How do I know what God's will for my life is? I haven't found that Bible verse that, that tells me whether or not I should enter the murky waters filled with bull sharks and go spearfishing. I keep thinking of the bad decisions I've made. Maybe you've thought of the will of God as some mysterious track through the time-space continuum. And, and you need to find that track. You need to follow the signs to stay on that track. And if you get off of it somehow, will you forever be on the B side of God's will? You know, the bizarro world on a parallel track of lesser living. Have you thought of God's will that way? Some, some mysterious path. You, you need to get the mystical signs to, to make sure that you find and a lot of the decisions that we make in the Christian life fall under this category of, I can't find a verse that speaks specifically to it, but I want to be pleasing to God. How do I know what to do? And I would suggest that that comes from the right heart and maybe some incomplete information. So what I want to do this morning is give us something of a roadmap for decision making. How do I think about decision making and the will of God? Let's just start with the first piece of this roadmap. We need to engage in dependent prayer. You need to be a prayerful person. You need to be someone who actually has a, 
a care about what God thinks about your decisions. It would be purely carnal, it would be purely fleshly and natural to go about your business in a self-willed style of decision making. I'm just going to do what I want. I'm going to do what feels right. I'm going to do what comes natural. I'm going to follow the crowd or drift with the culture. I'm, I'm just going to do what's next without giving thought about God at all. That, that would be a fleshly, natural, earthly approach to decision making. And so the first roadmap for us, the first sign, the first thing we need to get a hold of is, is a dependence, a, a radical dependence on the Lord that starts with a desire to please him. Turn to Colossians 1 verse 9. Colossians 1 verse 9. This is one of Paul's prayers recorded for us in scripture. By the way, if you've, if you've never taken a survey of the prayers of Paul and begun to incorporate the kinds of things Paul prays into your own prayer life, I would just recommend that exercise for you. It's a great way to pray for people when, when you don't have the words. Here's what Paul prays in Colossians 1.9. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, And here's the content, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul's prayer for the Colossian believers is that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. That's a wonderful starting place. It's a great thing to pray for yourself. God, I want to know your will. I I want you to show me your will. I I I want to follow your will. I am dependent on you as a creature and as a believer. I want to do things your way. And I want you to turn your attention to Proverbs 16, 9. This will be at the front end of what we're talking about this morning, and then we'll see it towards the end again. But this is an important principle for us. The mind of man plans his way, but Yahweh directs his steps. The mind of man plans his way, but Yahweh directs his steps. This is a neutral statement about the kind of man and the kind of mind that's making the kind of plans described. Nothing said about whether the the man is bad, the mind is bad, or the plans are bad. But simply, man makes plans and Yahweh directs the steps. This is an implicit trust in the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God even in our decision making. So with a heart that is geared toward dependent prayer, there is a biblical pathway for us making decisions that we'll walk through this morning, but in the end, you can trust Yahweh, you can trust the Lord. You make your plans, you put one foot in front of the other, and I think you incorporate into your prayers, oh Lord, I'm planning to do such and such. And we can assume the biblical pathway for decision making that we'll talk through this morning. I'm planning to do such and such. I'm going to take a step forward in these things. But, oh Lord, would you override? Would you overrule? Would you sovereignly place my feet where you want them to be? And that takes us out of the realm of some sort of paralyzed uh, paralyzed mysticism that waits for some miraculous sign or directive before we put a foot out. It does actually endorse the plans of man as a, as a general concept. Man makes plans. Without plans, you fail. But a man makes plans and the Lord directs the path. We need to know that. Uh, That will keep us from not making plans. It will keep us from not making decisions. But it keeps us in the realm of that radical dependence that says, God, I want to do your will. And in my desire to do your will, I'm going to go through a biblical process of decision making. And I trust you. I trust you to override, to overrule, to interrupt, to do whatever it is you need to do to accomplish your perfect plans, even as I make mine. Here's a second piece of the roadmap for decision-making. Be regular in your Bible intake. 
Be regular in your Bible intake. If you want to be someone who makes godly decisions, you need to think like God does. If, if you want to have a biblical perspective on how to be wise and how to choose what to do, then you need to think God's thoughts after Him. God has revealed Himself in His Word. God has not left us derelict or adrift apart from direction. And the more bibline your thinking the more biblical will your decision-making be. If you know God's Word because you're in the regular process of daily sitting under God's Word, meditating on God's Word, memorizing God's Word, chewing on it over and over again, sitting under teaching of God's Word, applying God's Word to your life, and not just your favorite passages, but the whole counsel of the Word of God. If that is your regular, steady diet... You will know how he thinks. You'll know how he thinks about specifics. You'll know how he thinks about principles. And that will help you make biblical decisions. That will help you in your godly decision making. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. This is a a classic text on the nature of God's word. And you may be aware of how Psalm 19 is built in the first half is this explanation of general revelation. What does nature declare about God? Elohim, the the word for God, the creator, is in the first half. But in the second half, the divine name, Yahweh, pervades. And the second half of the psalm moves us out of general revelation, or what we discover about God in nature, to what we get in specific revelation or special revelation, specifically the word of God. And then you have this katina of explanations of what God's word is like. And you see the parallels here, the law of Yahweh, beginning in verse seven, the testimony of Yahweh, the precepts of Yahweh, the commandment of Yahweh, the fear of Yahweh, the judgments of Yahweh. They are perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, and true. And look at the results. They restore the soul, make the wise simple, rejoice the heart, enlighten the eyes, endure forever. They are righteous altogether. And then the summary of all of them, they're better than gold. This is an invitation to take in God's word. Look down at verse 7 and the second half of verse 7. The testimony of Yahweh is sure. And then what does it do? It makes wise the simple. Confess your simpleness. Confess your puniness of mind. Recognize I will get wisdom. I will get it from God's word. And listen, the Bible is able to help you be a good decision maker. But it takes you having regular Bible intake. That's not something you can do in an afternoon, by the way. That's something you do as a regular daily discipline and as a habit of life, taking in God's word. And if you track your own Christian life, you look back in the rearview mirror and you think, my thinking has changed because I've been under God's word. That's a good sign. Neglect of God's word over time will leave you negligent. It will not make you want to be in God's word as you're absent from God's word. That's the discipline part. But it will also leave you adrift in your decision making. If you're not thinking God's thoughts, uh, they're not pervading the way you think about all things, then you will have a hard time making good decisions. Turn to Psalm 119. This is Psalm 19's twin, but longer. A masterful acrostic poem. That is, it sort of follows the Hebrew alphabet from beginning to end. In Psalm 119, 105, perhaps a familiar verse. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You want to see where you're going? You want to see where you should go? Make God's word your regular meditation. It will be a light and a lamp for your path, for your walking through this world. Here's a third waypoint in our roadmap for decision making. You need to know the will of God absolutes. You need to know the will of God absolutes. And what I mean by that is there are some statements in scripture that say, this is God's will for your life. You know, if we just stop and ask the question, what is God's will for my life? I need to know. I'm at a crux. I I have to make a decision. 
Well, why don't you just start with the statements that clearly say this is God's will for your life? I have the references there up on the screen for you. I'll start with Romans 12 2. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove a word that, that means to test and approve or, or sort of run through the, the mill of, of demonstration so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You want to know what God's will is for your life? Well, it starts with you being a living sacrifice, looking on the mercies of God built on the gospel. And it means you being not conformed to the pattern of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does that transformation happen? What we just talked about a minute ago. Regular daily Bible intake as a course and habit of life. Learning to think God's thoughts after him. Learning to be bibline in your thinking. And the transformation of mind is God's will for you and not being squeezed into the mold of the world and being renewed in the spirit of your mind will actually demonstrate for you God's will for your life, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. You want to know God's will for your life? Don't be squeezed by the world. Be transformed by the word. Look at Philippians 2.14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. And, and I put this one in the list. It doesn't explicitly say the will of God, but it just says do all things. So whatever the decision is about, uh, whatever the thing is you're concerned about, I, I want to know what is God's will for my life. Any of these all things commands or at all times do this kind of commands. This one's just an example of many. Well, whatever you decide to do should be done without grumbling or complaining. Similarly is 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks. Whatever it is you do, you, it has to be in gratitude. And this one gets more specific, more explicit. In everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What is God's will for my life? Well, it starts with giving thanks. I have to do that. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, this is the will of God. Your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Make no mistake about the will of God for your life, your sanctification, your progressive being set apart unto God, your progressive conformity to Christ. And a specific aspect of that in this verse is abstaining from sexual immorality. That is always God's will for your life. That, that you be doing that which brings you closer to conformity to Christ and farther away from sin. That's always God's will for your life. What's God's will for my life? Well, those things. 1 Peter 2.15 For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Okay, what's the will of God for my life when I'm in a difficult situation? <laughs> uh, under difficult people, perhaps. Do what's right. That, that's the will of God for your life. Do what's right. Whatever the next step is, make it the right step. That is in conformity with God's expectations. So we just have to start with these clear will of God absolutes. You want to know what God's will is for your life? Start with those statements that say this is God's will for your life. Your sanctification, giving thanks, not grumbling, in gratitude for the gospel, being a living sacrifice, not being squeezed by the world, but conformed to the word. Those things are God's will for your life. Those become a really helpful filter at the starting point about a decision you have to make. Will, will it fit through that grid of the clear will of God's statements? Here's a fourth waypoint in the roadmap for decision making. Obey the relevant commands. Obey the relevant commands. That is, open God's word and discover those commands and prohibitions that apply to your situation. Turn to John chapter 14. If you're trying to discover God's will for your life, and you just sort of bypass all the clear statements in the word about what to do and what not to do, then we're missing a really important concept. 
Listen to the way Jesus frames the idea of obedience to his commands. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. This takes the Christian life and love for Jesus and affections for Jesus and sort of Godwardness out of the realm of ushy gushy feelings and into the realm of rubber meets the road, real practical living. You can say you love God, but when you say, yeah, but I, I don't want to hear what he has to say, and I really don't want to do what he tells me to do, and I really would like to do what he tells me not to do, then the assessment from God's word is you're not loving God. Whatever your profession might be, whatever your emotions might say, what, whatever you might sing, to love God has very much to do with keeping Jesus' commandments. And then look down at verse 21. The one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. Now, this gets down to business for us when we think about what is it like to have a relationship to God. Sometimes in our Christian culture, a a mystical view of relationship sort of demands a two-way communication in an ongoing way. Like, I talk to God and he talks to me and, and that's a relationship. But the reality here, Jesus says, your relationship to God called love for him and reverberating with love from him is reflected in your obedience And what is obedience to God's command? It is simple faith practiced. It is simple faith practiced. I believe God's ways. I believe his words. He has prescribed for me a a right way to do things. He has prohibited from me a wrong way to do things. And I trust him. And what does that trust look like? I'm going to do what he says. And, And Jesus says, that's what love for me looks like. And if you do that, you love me and you keep my commandments, I will love you and I will disclose myself to you. In other words, if you want a a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, what will it look like? Opening his word, Jesus, what do you say? What what do you expect from my life? That's what I want to do. It's real relationship. It's, It's not sterile. That's not legalism. That's just what the Bible calls love. So we obey the commands. Do you remember the Great Commission in Matthew 28? This is the the marching orders of the church age, if you will. Jesus addressing those 11 disciples on the mountain in Matthew 28, beginning in verse 19. He says, make disciples of all the nations teaching them to observe all that I command you. What what does it mean to take the gospel to the ends of the earth? It it means to make disciples. Of course, he says, going and doing that, because they couldn't do that from the top of the mountain. Uh, They had to leave. And of course, they would be baptizing disciples. Those followers of Jesus Christ would give public testimony of their affiliation with Christ and his people through water baptism. But embedded right here in the Great Commission is this, you will be teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And where do we find that? That is essentially the New Testament doctrines. That is the New Testament commands and prohibitions. Jesus told the disciples, after I leave, the helper will come and he will teach you all the things. He'll bring to your remembrance what I taught you and he will lead you into all truth. These are Jesus truths contained for us in the New Testament and Jesus is here commissioning the disciples, teach the followers to do what I say. So you think about commands. You, you, you have a, a specific decision to make. Should I do such and such? And you start with those absolute will of God command statements And then you move to specific commands related to your situation. That is commands specific to your era, commands that are specific to your situation. Notice that not every imperative in the Bible is for you. Do you know what I mean by that? Not every command in the scripture 
is for you. Sometimes we read with a a me-centered approach and we come to a text, we drop in without the context, we don't care to ask who's it written to, what's it for, and we think, oh, this this must be about me because all the verses are about me. And you get a command like, build a boat and get all the animals and put inside of it. (laughs) Go therefore and do likewise. I mean, there's all kinds of commands in scripture that are not for you, out of time, out of sequence, out of context. I'm not saying look at all the grammatically imperatival forms of verbs and do all of them. You'll get in a lot of trouble that way. (laughs) But looking at the Bible, what does the Bible say to the Christian life? What must the Christian do and what must the Christian not do? This is a really helpful paradigm for us and, and you have to do your homework. Listen to Proverbs 20, 25. The wisdom writer says here, it is a trap for a man to say rashly, it is holy, and after the vows to make inquiry. Do do you catch the drift of that proverb? Shoot first and ask questions later. It's easy to ask forgiveness rather than permission. I'm just going to do what I want to do, and then I'll find out later if it's biblical. Don't do that. Don't be rash to say, oh yeah, it's okay. It's totally okay to do this. It's totally fine when you haven't done the homework. I would suggest to you that there's probably some homework we need to do as the world evolves in its moral norms. The moorings of morality are always changing in our world. And if we're not careful, the church just goes along with it. Now, we might be a few steps behind, we're not quite as cool, we're not quite as quick as the world, but we do what the world does eventually, typically. And we have to be very careful about that. I, I enjoy sports. I enjoy listening to sports radio and commentary. I, I love the lessons learned from competitive team sports, and, and I'm a fan of some teams. But... To listen to sports radio anymore, every single advertisement is an advertisement for gambling. This morning, I was listening to praise music on YouTube, interrupted by advertisements for sports betting. That's just bizarre. And and very easily, we just sort of say, oh yeah, it's totally okay, there's nothing wrong with it, it's fine. But... Maybe listen to Scott Demarest's equipping hour on gambling before you go down that path. Maybe open up your Bible and see what it says about a heart given to get rich quick schemes before you say, oh, no, no, it's holy. The proverb writer is helpful here. It is a trap for a man to say rashly, it is holy, and after the vows to make inquiry. It's a trap. In what sense? Well, Not only have you just done something that could have consequences for you and and stunted your spiritual growth, but you're also trapped by the reality that you have endorsed something that could be a stumbling block for others. And we just need to be careful about these things. Be careful what you endorse if you haven't done your homework. Get out your Bible, get out a study Bible. At the back of a study Bible is a sort of a a topical list of things you can look up and you can find out, hey, what does the Bible have to say about this? It's not exhaustive, but you can find out what the Bible has to say about sexual immorality or what the Bible has to say about various topics in life that will affect your decision making. Debt and finances or gambling, a a study Bible will will have headings for those things. So you need to look up those things. You can get out a topical Bible. A topical Bible is a a bigger version of the back of a study Bible. And it has many more headings and many more Bible references. You can get out a concordance and just look up words. You can phone a friend. Hey, does the Bible have anything to say about gambling? Drunkenness? Card playing? Dancing? Water skiing? Artificial sweeteners? Marrying a non-Christian? I just threw in a whole bunch of random categories, and you're wondering, does Smed think water skiing is sin? 
No comment. I'm just saying that the question is, does the Bible have anything to say about these things? And, and you need to do your homework. There may be prohibitions you are not aware of. There may be prohibitions you're avoiding. There may be commands that you're not aware of. And, and you might be given to things that may not be sinful in and of themselves, but you're avoiding things you should be doing. And so the, even the non-sinful things you endorse and embrace keep you from doing the things you must be doing as a believer in Jesus Christ. What you have to say at the bottom is, I want to love Jesus in this decision. And so, God, does your word clearly command or prohibit me in this? We've got to do the homework on the clear commands. All right, a fifth step or, or waypoint here is to wisely apply pertinent principles. Wisely apply pertinent principles. The Bible may not speak directly by command or prohibition to the decision that you are to make. But there may be principles involved. Uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I really believe it would take a lifetime to unpack this concept because a lifetime will present a lifetime's worth of opportunities to wisely apply biblical principles to changing situations. I think it's one of the reasons that the Bible doesn't get so specific and so narrow about things that then become time-stamped. But the Bible gives us timeless principles to apply to various situations. So I'm just going to point you to a, a passage that sort of weaves back and forth between clear commands and prohibitions and principles to be applied with wisdom. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 28 and 29. And this is in a section of a New Testament letter to Christians flowing out of the therefore, the great big therefore turn. Gospel, 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 therefore, here's how you live. So Ephesians 4, 28 and 29. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Okay, in verse 28, you've got a clear command and a clear prohibition. Clear command, don't steal. That's just non Well, can, can, can the end justify the means, Lord? Can, can I steal something? Can I pull a Robin Hood over here? Uh, no, don't steal. And work, labor with your hands. The Bible affirms that in a number of places. He, he who does not work is not to eat. There, there is a clear command not to be a mooch, not to slough off, not to be lazy, but to provide for yourself and for others. And so clear command, clear prohibition, don't steal, you must work. And then performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Here's another command in a positive statement, share. In other words, work just not to be hand to mouth, to make ends meet, but work so that you can be generous. Work so that you can give, so that you can meet needs. What does the text not tell us? What's a real need? When should I give it? How much? Right there is, is a whole bag of principles that must be unpacked in a given situation. Texts like this were compelling to me when I was in Chicago as a college student. And, and I didn't have money. What little I had, I, I actually carried change and, and a few bills with me into the city, knowing that every time I went out on the, on the sidewalks in the streets of Chicago, I would be addressed by a panhandler asking for change. And I got a really good tip as a, as a freshman in college, carry change with you and be ready to meet needs and be ready, don't hand out cash. <laughs> they helped us understand that the homeless in Chicago had access to food and shelter and the, the basic needs that, that were required of them. And that nearly universally handing out cash would go to destructive practices. So, but be generous. Be ready to meet needs. So I, I carried money with me so that I could offer to meet needs. And in dozens and dozens and dozens of opportunities, 
I only had two people take me up on the need. If they asked for a bus token, I said, hey, I'll walk down with you to the subway and, or, or the station and buy you a bus token. Hey, you, you, you need a subway ticket? Hey, I'll go with you. Where do you want to ride? Let's have a conversation. I looked for gospel opportunities and I was ready to meet needs. And, and the two times that, that somebody said, hey, I'm really hungry and I just need some cash. Hey, I'll go with you. Where do you want to eat? Talked him into going, one guy into a McDonald's and one into a, a Checkers burger joint. Neither man ate. And after I left, the, the second man tried to resell the burger I bought for him. So that was a significant lesson that there was wisdom required to apply a verse like Ephesians 4.28. Uh, the city of Chandler, the same way, the, the intersections by my house all have signs that says, don't give to panhandlers. It, it, it doesn't help. <laughs> Consider giving to local charities. And, and the panhandlers sit there under the signs asking for money and people give money. I'm not sure that's wise. Is a generous heart biblical? Actually, it's commanded. Work hard, ready to give. And wisdom is needed for the decision making. Uh, there's principles involved. That, that's just one example of, of the interplay in our Bible between clear commands and prohibitions. Not every conceivable situation is worked out for us in specifics. What about the question, should I date a non-Christian? Should I date a non-Christian? Uh, you, you know the passage. 2 Corinthians 6.14, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? That's a, that's a general statement. That's a prohibition. Did you notice it doesn't get specific about marriage? It is a principle applied appropriately to marriage. <laughs> what closer partnership is there than a marriage? And so it is appropriate to apply this text to marriage relationships. What does that mean for a dating relationship? Well, if dating is marriage prep, then an appropriate way to apply this principle is don't date an unbeliever. Don't consider it. Don't even go down that path. Don't let your heart go down that path. I want to suggest to you that we zoom out on this verse and think, not, don't just limit this verse to marriage, which is an application by principle, but ask this question. Should we go into ministry partnerships with unbelievers? Should we go into ministry partnerships with unbelievers? Um, think about an organization like Finisterre. Task is, take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Take the gospel, uh, Bible translation, and church planting into the Finisterre Mountains of Papua New Guinea. Should that organization partner with, say, UNICEF, take funds from the UN? Um, I mean, there, generally, there's a humanitarian concern. Those kinds of partnerships comes with strings and compromises because those two organizations are fundamentally geared to go two different directions. They have no partnership. If you think you want to publish Bibles, for instance... And you're in partnership financially with unbelievers who do not love the word of God and don't share the same values. You will run into problems. Church leadership with unbelievers is problematic. I mean, you, you see, there's a, there are a whole host of room for application of this principle coming out of a clear prohibition. Don't be unequally yoked. And there are a number of different ways to apply that principle. The closer the relationship, the, the closer the relationship gets to the things of the Lord and to eternal things, the more danger there is in being yoked together with people who don't love the Lord. Those are just examples of the application of pertinent principles. And again, this takes work. You, you, you need to do your homework. Number six, seek godly and wise counsel. Turn to the book of Proverbs Seek godly and wise counsel. Proverbs 1.5 says, A wise man will hear and will increase in learning. And a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. 
Turn over to Proverbs 11 and verse 14. Where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in abundance of counselors, there is victory. And in Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Now, what is the injunction here? Get people outside of your own head speaking into your decision making. Not just any people. Wise people. Uh, This is an important principle for us. Uh, we, We need to be looking to others for help. To go to people who know God's word and have a track record of applying biblical principles to life situations... Those are the kind of wise people you want to seek out. Don't look for counsel from people with a bad track record. Don't don't look for counsel for your decision making from people who don't know God's word or who stumble around with principles applied to life situations. Get wise counsel, godly counsel. And number seven, act on sanctified desires. Act on sanctified desires. When you've got clear commands, pertinent principles, do what you want. That may, that may seem abrupt. I would suggest that we can be paralyzed sometimes thinking that, well, just do what I want doesn't sound quite right. But if our desires are sanctified... Your desires are part of the path that God uses you to uses to move you along in his sovereign plan for your life. Again, we're not looking from for some mysterious will of God that we've got to get to by mystical signs, but God using the means of godly wisdom applied with biblical principles, sitting under clear biblical commands, following those will of God absolutes from a dependently prayerful heart that wants to please the Lord. That's what I mean by sanctified desires. Turn to Colossians 1.10. A mind saturated with the word of God is going to tend to love the things that God loves, hate the things that God hates, and be well informed to make decisions. This goes back to just being regular in your Bible intake. Colossians 1.10, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, multiplying in the full knowledge of God. Again, this is part of Paul's prayer for believers. To be pleasing to the Lord, to have that as our desire. We ought to have as our desire a priority for holiness. Look at 1 Corinthians 10.23. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Not everything that can be done should be done. And to paraphrase Jerry Rag, he says, don't let common graces squeeze out special graces. In other words, there are many things that are okay to do as a believer. Does that mean it's the best thing for you to do in this moment, in a given situation, in the environment that you're in, or the time that you're in? Make sure that you are valuing those things that only Christians have access to, and not just valuing everything the world can do too. That leads us to having eternal valuations. Colossians 1.3, set your mind on things above, where Christ is seated in the heavenlies. If you set your affections on eternal things, 2 Corinthians 4.18, we look not to the things that are seen, but unseen. The things that are seen are temporary. The things that are unseen are eternal. If we have our heart set on eternal things, that will shape our decision making because it will shape our desires. It begins to sanctify our desires. And then we also need to think about the needs of others. Listen to Romans 12 verse 10. This ought to infiltrate our thinking so that it affects what we desire, so that it affects our decision making. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. Are you thinking about others? 
a few helpful questions in your decision making or just to ask, is it holy? Is it helpful? Is it edifying? Will it please the Lord? Will he be beneficial, helpful on an eternal scale? Does it help others? Step eight in this pathway for decision making is to evaluate your decision making. Evaluate your decision making. Uh, that is to look at your decisions in a rear view mirror. And a few cautions here. The rightness of a decision is not measured by its outcomes. The rightness of a decision is not measured by its outcomes. Oh, that didn't turn out the way that I wanted. It must have been a wrong decision. Oh, the, the results of that were really hard. Hard's not bad. Rightness does not equal comfort and ease. You need to evaluate the counsel that you received and the counselors you sought. Continue to read your Bible. There's a time and a place for course correction, to confess and repent of bad decision making. Uh, we always need to be teachable. We sometimes get in trouble when we feel like we need to defend the decision we already made. That's a natural human tendency. We can always reevaluate. It's a mark of humility. And again, the rightness of a decision is not measured by the outcomes. That's just pragmatism. Whatever works must have been the right thing to do. Hard's not bad. Don't confuse difficult with wrong. In fact, one strategy that God uses in the life of every one of his children is difficulty, trials. These are designed to make you more Christ-like, more humble, more dependent, and more useful. So embrace that. The rearview mirror may help you rethink your decision making, but the outcomes aren't the metric. So I just gave you an eight step process for finding God's will. I'd like to simplify that a little bit. And to simplify it, I want to assume some of the things we just covered. So assume you're a believer, reading God's word, praying about decisions, seeking godly counsel, that you know the will of God absolutes. Now, how do I make a decision? I'm going to give you three steps. Commands, principles, desires. Follow clear commands, apply biblical principles, and do what you want. Okay, that is, that is the, the simplified way to say everything we just talked about in eight steps boiled down to three. Do you have a fear that this is somehow independent, faithless, or non-relational decision-making? Maybe it's ungodly, like it's missing something. Maybe this leaves God out of the decision-making process. You know, I'd, I'd feel more comfortable if there were some two-way mystical interaction. I, I want to have a sign a word from heaven, some supernatural confirmation that what I'm about to choose is the right path that will keep me squarely in that time-space portal of the perfect will of God for my life. I don't want to miss it. I would suggest to you that the roadmap we just looked at is not self-willed, independent, godless decision-making. All of that, I believe, is radically dependent Submitting yourself to God's revealed word, subjecting your personal desires to the priorities of holiness, eternal valuations, and the needs of others. That is actually spiritual work, and it is dependent work. It's not mystical, but it is spiritual. I believe it's actually independent and faithless to rely on signs and mystical impressions as guideposts for the will of God. Such guidance actually rejects God's revealed will and makes an assumption that God is speaking to me in ways that he isn't. And we need to be careful about that. For the remainder of our time, I want to cover some whatabouts. Some whatabouts. The first one, what about what ifs? You ever think about the what ifs? What if it wasn't the right decision? What if there's a better option than one that I've thought of? Then we need to be careful not to confuse obedience versus providence. What I mean by that is, I'm finite. I have what's in front of me. I, I may have to make a decision. If it's not about clear commands of Scripture or violating a biblical principle, and I have to choose red shirt or blue shirt out of my closet, don't confuse that with right-wrong categories. What if I pick the one God didn't want me to pick? Is it sin? Not if God hasn't revealed it so. 
And we can paralyze ourselves with the wrong kind of thinking on that. And we don't confuse categories of, be- of obedience with categories of wisdom. Listen, we want God's wisdom. But sometimes we, we can say things like, well, wisdom would dictate that you fill in the blank. And all of a sudden, a wisdom paradigm that's laden with principles applied in various ways to various circumstances becomes a command in the hands of somebody who wants to wield it. If you were wise, you would do it my way. And we can leverage preferences under this phrase, wisdom would dictate. Think about Proverbs when it says, answer a fool according to his folly. And then it says, don't answer a fool according to his folly. Uh, Wisdom would dictate that you never or always... No, no, no. There there are circumstances where either one of those is applicable. I believe thinking about the what-ifs can get us into a paralysis of indecision, of second-guessing, and of hypotheticals. That the Bible ends up just calling laziness. Listen to Proverbs 26, 13. The sluggard says, there's a lion in the road, a lion in the open square, and he doesn't go to work, and he doesn't provide for his family. Why? Because, well, a large predatory cat could be out there, might be. And listen, he's not wrong, hypothetically. I mean, even in New York City, sometimes they get out of the zoo and they roam the streets. Certainly in the ancient Near East, this was closer to home. But the Bible calls him a sluggard. He's lazy. He's worried about the hypotheticals and doesn't make a decision and actually neglects what he should be doing because he doesn't do what he, he hasn't made a decision about what to do. The correction to this laziness is not hastiness. We have to beware the just do something syndrome. Sometimes we cause more damage by making a rash decision. And you get people that will say, there's a problem, do something. Okay, let's not create more problems. Let's do the right thing. But I believe there is liberation in a three-step approach that says, assuming all the other things, God, what have you told me to do and not to do? What are the principles involved? Okay, I desire to do this. I'm going to put one foot in front of the other, and I'm going to trust you to direct my path. I think that's liberating. What about fleeces? You can read the story in Judges 6, 36 to 40 about Gideon putting out a fleece. I believe Gideon was faithless in the fleece test. God told him what he would do. And Gideon asked questions like, well, how how do I know you're going to do it? (laughs) It should just be enough that God said he would do it. Well, no, let me put out a fleece. And if it's wet, great. No, okay, let me try again. Let me put out the wet fleece. And if it's dry, then I'll believe... That's putting God to the test. And God was merciful with Gideon. That's not an endorsement. And I want to give some reminders about fleeces. I know this is common Christian cultural colloquialism. It doesn't make it the right way to make a decision. I'm going to put out a fleece. That just becomes part of the Christian vocabulary. An error is the making narrative normative. You read the Bible, a story about somebody, and it just says they did something. We don't make that normal. You don't make a a, a narrative an imperative. And narrator silence is not an endorsement. Well, God didn't thunder down from heaven in that moment and tell Gideon to stop putting out fleeces. It must be okay. That must be what I should do. Uh, You're importing too much. By the way, the narrator is not silent in Judges. You actually get his assessment in Judges 17.6 and in 21.25. In those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's not an endorsement. That's a don't do it like you saw it in Judges statement. Very clearly from the narrator. What about still small voices? As far as I can discern, the verse from which this still small voice thing comes from, is 1 Kings 19, 12. After the earthquake, there was a fire. Yahweh wasn't in the fire. After the fire, a sound of gentle blowing. But somehow, this idea of a still small voice has made it into Christian colloquialism and decision-making. Well, I don't know what to do. I'm going to wait for that still small voice. Am I supposed to be listening to some guidance from God outside of His Word, some audible voice? 
Um, no, no, I mean, but not out loud, you know, but some really strong impression of divine communication to me personally about what I should do next. Again, I know this is common. It, it doesn't make it the right way to make a decision. You're not a prophet like Elijah receiving direct revelation. By the way, there's high stakes being a prophet. If you're ever wrong, get your friends to get a pile of rocks and take you outside. We don't, we don't want to put words into God's mouth this way. Feelings, impressions, intuitions, and saying, oh, that's God telling me what to do next. What about signs? And you can put under this coincidences, deja vu, weird occurrences, hunches. Listen, godly decision making is not a divining rod. Remember what the divining rod was? It's kind of a Y-shaped stick that people would go out there and feel for water under the ground so you could dig a well and have water for your farm. We, we treat decision making like that sometimes. I'm, I'm just waiting for the next sort of sign, weird occurrence. What did Jesus say about signs? Matthew 12, 39. An evil and adulterous generation craves a sign. Luke 16, 29. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. But he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Listen, man is not to get signs from God that go beyond his word. We've been given his word. Uh, There have been times and places where God clearly gave signs for specific purposes. There are times where God clearly gave direct revelation to prophets and apostles. Jesus himself was God's direct revelation on the earth when he was here. His voice will thunder again from heaven and prophets will, will speak again on the earth. But in our day, we are given God's word and we have everything we need for life. And for godliness. Listen, you can convince yourself that just about anything is a sign from God. We understand confirmation bias and selective memory. Confirmation bias is the signs reinforce my preconceived ideas. And the selective memory is you remember when they worked. And you conveniently forget the times it didn't work and you were kind of a false prophet. What about open doors? Hey, there's an open door. This is an opportunity. There are no hindrances. Uh, There are green lights for me in this. What what doors are open to me right now? That must be God's will. And I would just suggest to you that open doors are, are merely a way to talk about opportunity and ability. I have the time, the money, the skill, and nobody's impeding me. Nobody's stopping me. It's an open door. That's not biblical decision making. That's just God's providence. And I believe open doors are a legitimate biblical metaphor. I have four texts for you up on the screen. But just as a sample, 1 Corinthians 16, 9, a wide door of effective service has been opened to me and there are many adversaries. Paul says, Paul uses this metaphor four times to describe opportunities for gospel preaching. God opened a door. Open door statements mean that when you evaluate everything else, And God and his providence doesn't overrule an otherwise godly, biblical, and wise decision. We could talk about that as an open door. You could walk through. And there might be three. But listen, 18 open doors in your hallway does not mean 18 viable, biblical, God-honoring solutions to your decision-making process. Just because something's open to you doesn't mean it honors the Lord or would please him. So don't make open and closed doors your guidance system. If it's open, it must be God's will. (laughs) What about the leading of the Spirit? Two texts describe the leading of the Spirit. Romans 8, 12 to 14 and Galatians 5, 18. Both contexts describe specifically the leading of the Spirit has to do with the Spirit of God indwelling the believer, leading the believer to put to death the deeds of the body, to fight sin. If you import decision-making into those texts, you're bringing something into the text that isn't there. What if I prayed about it? Doesn't mean I made the right decision. Hey, I prayed about it and I decided. Well, prayer is not revelatory. Prayer is us talking to God. The Bible is God talking to us. 
We must be dependent in prayer. We must go to him. But to say, I prayed about it and now I've reached my decision. Um, I don't know that we've done everything we need to do yet. What if I have a peace about it? Again, that doesn't mean it's the right decision. A really striking depiction of having a peace but being in the wrong is found in Proverbs chapter 30. Verse 20. This is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wrong. She has a peace about it. You can have a seared conscience. There's a way that seems right to a man and the end is death. So I, I hope in um, maybe simplifying the will of God, decision making, it's liberating for you. Um, I'll point to you uh, a couple of resources. One is entitled Decision Making the Will of God by Gary Friesen. It's a really long book and it eventually gets you to kind of the same three points. A shorter version of that is John MacArthur's book called Found God's Will. Very accessible, easy to read, and will reinforce some of the things we talked about this morning. All right, let me close in prayer. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word as a light to our feet. We want to be pleasing to you. We want to do what is your will. And we pray that our lives submitted to you as living sacrifices, subjected under the clear commands and the principles of your word, that our own hearts and lives would be sanctified and that you would give us wisdom by these means to make good decisions. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're dismissed for about 10 minutes before main service.